question for you as we start out this morning. Do you have a favorite scripture passage? One that rings in your heart, possibly has given you direction? Something that has spoken to you? Have you ever thought about it? It's interesting because several times recently while gathered with families to prepare a memorial service, we've often asked of ourselves, did our loved one have a favorite passage that would, we would love to have read during the memorial service? And frequently we haven't shared that information with our family members because maybe we haven't answered that question ourselves. I know there's some that speak so much at times of loss to families. Bet you can guess what they are. The 23rd Psalm and John 14. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If, I were not if it were not so, would I have told you that I'd go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. Wonder if you can answer that question at some point this morning. Think about it. What in scripture has spoken to you? Maybe a confirmation passage, something that's helped you. I know for my dad, it was the 121st Psalm. Something about lifting up his eyes to the hills was always helpful to him. But I noticed, I brought my mother's Bible with me, and it was fun yesterday to take a moment to look, at through, look through various things that she had marked. And one of them was John 10, I'm the Good Shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. For some reason, that really spoke at some point to my mother, and I appreciate that. For me, it's something that rings around this passage from Luke that was first read. There's a portion in it, it's interesting, that the translation here drops, the, the King James Version maintains. And boy, when it comes to this passage, I love the King James reading because this is what is dropped. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This is what gets dropped. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Some of the translations with King James go, he came to heal those that were bruised of spirit. And that portion, to heal the brokenhearted, to heal them that are bruised of spirit was where I found resonance in scripture. That with a broken heart, there can be healing. That one not, might not be alone in the midst of brokenness and challenge to their lives. That Christ promises to be there with us. That's the passage that's resonated with me. Well, it's interesting that I think for Jesus, this Luke passage resonated for him. Let's look at this story for a little second. It appears that he's fresh off the desert. We're going to be looking at that passage when we get to L-E-N-T, the word I'm not ready to say yet. Lent, I said it. He's fresh off the desert where you would think he would be tired, thirsty, depleted. But Jesus comes off the desert, fresh and full of the Spirit. He comes resounding into his home territory. And even before he has spoken this passage, his inaugural address of Luke, he's already begun to touch lives, to heal people. And that word has already spread to Nazareth, which was his hometown. So full of the encounter in the desert with the devil, full of God's presence with him, he comes into Nazareth, which we have to understand probably was a community of maybe two or three hundred people. So I don't even know if they had a synagogue building or whether they gathered together somewhere in the marketplace or out in the countryside. So it's not a huge gathering here where Jesus preaches his inaugural address. The first words that we hear from Jesus by, by the pen of Luke he returns and as was his custom, he came to Nazareth to the synagogue, to those that were gathered there. And he is given to him, what's given to him is a scroll of the book of Isaiah, and he opens Torah, opens this passage, searching for words. If you open your Bibles right now, you'll see he looked there until he found 
Isaiah 61. His eyes were searching for the text that would speak of his heart, of his mission and purpose, and these are the first words that Jesus reads. Sorry, I'm turning the page here. Coming to bring release to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, the year of the Lord's favor. In a nutshell, Jesus begins in Luke here with the words that will be his mission and the words that are the gospel that are speaking of love and peace and restoration. Not vengeance. I think some point people that day were a little disappointed that Jesus wasn't coming with words of building armies, bringing vengeance, because remember, this period of time, Israel was being oppressed, and it was not a happy day, and they were hoping for the anointed one to come and say, let's raise an army, we're going to march into Jerusalem, and we're going to take over. Jesus doesn't do that. He reads these words that I feel like brought a different kind of message and healing to a community that needed to hear that in spite of how the social and religious culture was in that day and age, oppressed a holiness code that there was hope in being lost and feeling as if they were sinners there was good news that god loved them that god had come that god had come to redeem to forgive to bring grace and to bring love <clears throat> to recognize that love had come to town we just sang about my chains are gone i've been set free for some listening that day Hearing these words of Jesus meant hope that as sinners, God had come to love them. But and we don't go on to the next part of the text. I didn't ask Juan if he was going to pick up on this next week. Are you going to? Yes? I'll leave it. All right, I'll leave it. There were those who were not happy with Jesus. We even begin to get a hint of that in what was read. They don't care to hear from Joseph's son this news. We'll wait till next week for the next part of the story. But Jesus here brings first words of love and grace and mercy. It's got a justice ring to it. And it's not brand new news. He's reading Torah, the prophets, Isaiah 61. is bringing news of those who had been taken off to captivity, that you would be brought back, that there would be release, that there would be forgiveness again that love had come to town. One of the folks I was reading this week made a note about how Abraham Lincoln, in his second inaugural address, bound words with this passage. Victory was just coming post-Civil War here. It was almost ending within days. Slavery was being taken seriously and had the possibility of ending. But what he notes is that there was wrong on both sides. And instead of great happiness that we're coming to the end and the resolve that we have won, deep sadness because of the unshakable evil of slavery that had torn a country apart, the toll it had exacted, and a call to stay the course, to resolve things caused by the war and the grief that had come. You can see this address. It's also part of what's engraved there at the Lincoln Memorial. These are some of the words though. Let us strive on to finish the work we are bound up in. Let's heal and bind up the nation's wounds to care for him who shall have borne the battle for his widow and his orphan to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Jesus' words resounding even to the end of the Civil War to the words of Abraham Lincoln, the call to see the depth of this challenge. It's not just releasing of oppression that we feel within our souls, but it was also the call by Jesus to live that gospel out. It's a hard thing to think about in our day and age. Hmm. 
what needs to be released and opened and changed. But I do believe it still starts with us. The place to begin with this inaugural address by Jesus is to look into the face of whether we believe we really need good news. The nutshell, good news, love come to town. It's not until we realize we need to hear good news that we really feel it within. Why this passage had resounded for me was because of the break of my parents, because of being lost in so many things. I couldn't see beyond that to the possibility of what could happen in my life. I felt so abandoned at points. That's what happens sometimes. And suddenly when I heard this passage, I had hope that God would not leave me if I opened my life to God, that there was healing and possibility for a broken heart shattered by parental relationships. That's why it spoke to me. But it also was a power, a thing to come into my life to say, hmm, there's good news to share with other friends. That it felt as if there would never be a today of hope or a year of God's favor and possibility. Why does that passage ring with me? Because it spoke to me. Why and what passages speak to you today? Why do they resound? What story do they tell of the gospel? Well, I have a friend who heard the gospel story about the woman at the well. Something about Jesus talking with her. I've mentioned this before. The very moment at which Jesus sat with her to talk, in this picture of the woman at the well, my friend began to believe in Jesus in a new way. If Jesus would sit with her, the woman at the well, and talk and listen to her, maybe Jesus will listen to me too. Another friend, Vince, always committed to social justice or issues, read this passage and felt hope to be a force and an action to help with some oppressive things that were happening in Pittsburgh. And there's another picture that comes to us from this passage, and that's the promise of the beloved kingdom of God. Something that is open for all of us to become members of if we see the need for that nutshell piece of knowing the love of God in our hearts. It was the long passage I read pointing up to an empty screen. That's not helpful, but it reads that there's a place for everyone. The kingdom of God, the beloved community, has a place for each one of us gathered here today. A role, gifts, insights, passion, something you feel called to that you need to be sharing with us. There's a place for everyone. Where's Jim Pratt? Right before worship, Jim, I'm talking, I'm tattling Jim. He comes running up to me and he says, I really think I see a new thing for the deacons to do. He said, I feel called to action, was the words that you used. One deacon, action, there's so much we could do on a Sunday morning. Visit, greet, prepare fellowship, one man action. It's our gym. Nonetheless, it's that very way in which as a body when we're gathered here Sunday morning, when you step back, which I'm sure you have, you've seen parents and others doing wonderful work upstairs or downstairs with our children. You see people gathered downstairs preparing fellowship. The choir's in the chapel. Maybe Revelation is running around trying to pull our music together. There are various ways in which together, oof, for this period of time that we're gathered in this building, we're working together, feet, eyes, hands, stomach. All is possible, all is necessary. For this to happen, we need each one of you. I'm looking at you guys over there, you young ones. Do you know how much we need you? You are a part of our community. You need to hear that. And it's a radical text, this Corinthians, that we're pulling in just for a moment, because the belief at that time was, oh, there was only one head, and that was Caesar, and you bowed down to him. And what Paul is suggesting here is that, no, Christ is the head. The beloved kingdom is the call. The beloved community, where everyone has a role to play, where everyone is key in pulling off the work of the gospel. And the Spirit makes it possible. The Spirit at work. The same Spirit that brought Jesus out of the desert into Nazareth with words of hope and love, providing a plumb line for our work. You know, the plumb line is where you find 
the level. The plumb line is the true. And that's what these words from the beginning of the gospel offer to us. How do our lives measure up until in terms of goals and in terms of gifts with these few words, the short inaugural address that is brought to us here in the gospel? Where do you see yourself in scripture? What scripture passage speaks to you today? I'm hoping it's one that says to you something about good news and about your call to believe in God. What a good news about the inclusion of everybody within the community of faith. I got a message from the commander of the Coast Guard this week on Facebook. She said, I can't thank you enough for the meal at Glen Allen. We had taken some gas cards and food cards down, cards down to the Coasties. She said, thank you, can't thank you enough. We've invited them back up for the next meal that we have in February because hopefully our relationship doesn't end just with a furlough temporary, oh, the furlough ending. You could hear me say temporarily. I have a friend that served in this, this uh, presbytery who's now living in Arizona who's had health concerns, but she sent on Facebook yesterday a prayer request, which was instantly answered by 150 people, the former parishioners throughout the Presbytery too. Her husband has a brain tumor. And she was asking for prayer. We'll pray for Renee, pray for her husband later. Isn't it interesting how the body could be seen as a very broad and big and amazing community? We can pull off a meal, it was a lot of work for the Coast Guard to be with us, but we're ready to take on with the Sunspot bus, hopefully them joining us again. And for Renee and her husband, surrounding them with prayers, no matter how distant and far off, that's an opportunity and the call to the community here, the call to being the body of Christ. And so as many of you know, with a tidying up person on Netflix, have you been watching that at all? You can be brave and raise your hand. Oh good, there's a big one in the back. <laughs> what does it mean to tidy up our lives? And I really get this because I think there's something about the clutter that sometimes can drive you nuts and lose focus and you just can't find your way. Oh, it might be the clutter of stuff and possessions and the sentimental nature of things. Yep, there's certain things that were my mother's or my father's that's really hard to toss out. I need her help. I need to see if she'll come, Haley, and join us. What about what mutters up our souls? What is it about the gospel? What is it about the spirit? What is it about scripture? Finding yourself. Find yourself. You are here. This book contains the word of God. It's something that we need to have dwelling in us. It's something that can resound to the very tips of your toes, I promise you. If you take the time to look and ponder, to think and pray, and within the beloved community to assist one another, to find out how we can clean our hearts, our souls out, declutter, desentimentalize, once again find ourselves and to hold ourselves in a new way because scripture offers that picture to us. I know I asked Lon to find it for me, and I'm lost. Yep, anyway, <laughs> though we are to clothe ourselves in family, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. And above all else, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together and perfect harmony. Scripture, when I can find it, leads us to see what it is we can clothe ourselves with, the tidying that can be done in our lives, and to really believe that together in this kind of work of tidying and sharing the good news, that we really are better together, to be the servants, the beloved community, and the agents of the love of God. Would you take a moment to pray with me?
We thank you, Lord, for your presence and your grace and your mercy, the ways in which you make yourself known to us, that you have given us words of life that come to us through Scripture, through the work of the Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Help us to believe that we have a desperate need for you deep down inside as sinners and as those who are broken. <coughs> And to hear the great good news and promise that you come to our hearts with mercy, with love and grace. Your spirit works within us and we are bound in a whole new way together in the community of the beloved one. So thank you, Lord. Thank you. Be with us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand in